Hello there, I'm Gary Sims from Android Authority. Now you've probably used your smartphone quite a lot for taking photos. You probably just get out of your pocket and you point and shoot and it takes a photo and it's all done automatically. What's interesting though is that a lot of uh, smartphones now include a manual mode on the camera, particularly at the high end. So the question before always stay is, how do you take a picture using manual mode on your smartphone? Well, let me explain. Now finding manual mode is different on every camera. On some cameras it's tucked away amongst the other modes like time lapse and panorama and slow mo and there'll be one mode there called either professional mode or manual mode. You just tap on that mode and an extra set of controls will appear on the screen. On some cameras it's actually always on screen, just hidden away, you just have to slide up or slide to the side and these extra con controls will appear. And when you slide them away again, everything will go back to being on automatic. Now to understand how to take a picture with manual mode, you need to understand what these controls do. Now the first control I'm going to talk about is called metering mode. Now taking a photo is all about light, how much light there's coming into the sensor. Now obviously if you're outdoors in bright sunlight or if you're indoors in a restaurant, there is a difference between the amount of light that's coming into the sensor. And so the camera has to measure that amount of light and that's called metering, the metering mode. Now the standard metering mode is called matrix metering where the whole frame is used and the average average light is taken across the whole frame as the amount of light coming into the camera. The problem is if you have a bright source, like say a light from on the ceiling or the sun shining in and it's inside the frame, that can actually distort the amount of light that the camera thinks is coming in. So therefore you have an option to pick different types of metering mode. And one of them is called just spot metering where you just literally, it just says one spot, the center spot is where it's going to measure the light. And that's useful when you want to exclude bright light sources from other areas of the frame. Even better is what's called center metering, where it's not just a center spot, but actually just the stuff in the middle. Maybe if you're taking a portrait or you're taking a photo of something, just the light that's available on that thing that you're taking. And my favorite is tap metering, where you're actually able to tap on your touch screen and you say to the phone where I've tapped, that's where I want you to measure the light source. And that's good for tapping on someone or something in a photo that's not quite in the center. Maybe you're taking an artistic shot and you want the light on someone's portrait to the left, but you want to capture something else uh, in the rest of the frame or for bringing out the detail in something that's maybe in a part of the shade. Now the next thing you should play around with is the shutter speed. Now back in the days of film, there was, uh, and today with uh, DSLR cameras, there's actually a physical shutter that would open up for a fraction of a second, let the light in, and then close down again. And how long that shutter is open depends on how much light can go in. Now on a smartphone, there's not an actual shutter, it's done using the sensor, it's activated for a fraction of a second and then disactivated. So it's on and then off. And how long it's on for is how much light is coming into the photo. Now with a far shutter speed, you can capture action really, really well. So if you're capturing sports, let's say football, or you're capturing a racing car, or you're capturing, let's say, you know, a child uh, doing something interesting or a dog shaking water off itself, then having a far shutter speed means that you capture, you freeze the moment perfectly with clarity in just a fraction of a second. At the other end, you have a slow shutter speed, which means the shutter speed is open for a long time, and that will actually add some different effects. For so example, it might add some blur. So if someone is running with a football or a car is going past, you can actually get that sense of motion by including a slight bit of motion blur with it. It's also good at nighttime if you want to take pictures of car tail lights as they're going down the road, you can leave the shutter open for a longer period of time and get those red streaks uh, and to capture some artistic photos like that. It's also good with water. If you want to take water coming over a waterfall and use a slow shutter speed, you get that silky effect of the water as it kind of adds that motion blur to the water cascading over the edge. Now the problem with shutter speed is that when you go for slow shutter speeds, you also introduce the problem of camera shake. No matter how hard steady you think you're holding your mobile phone, you are actually slightly moving it. And all that motion of you moving actually then gets added to the photo, not the motion of the subject moving, but your movement, and that makes the whole thing become blurry. So if you're using slow shutter speeds, you really do need to use a tripod. 
Now the companion of shutter speed is the ISO speed. Now back in the old days when it was actual film, the film actually had to have a rating to say how quickly it reacts to light. Now there were various different standards over the years from different manufacturers and in the end the International Standards Organization, ISO, actually came up with a, a, a scale to say how fast film reacts and the scale is logarithmic. So ISO 200 is twice as fast as ISO 100, ISO 400 is twice as fast as 200, 800 twice as fast as 400 and so on. Now we've used that same idea even into digital photography and it basically tells you how sensitive the sensor is going to be to capturing the light. Now the problem with high ISO numbers is, is that they introduce a lot of noise because the sensor is trying really hard to capture that light very very quickly it sometimes doesn't do it very well and it introduces specs and, and, and it's a very noisy picture, it's not a uniform color on the picture. So in general, for good quality, you need lower ISO speeds. But of course, light is the key here. You can't use a low ISO speed inside of a, a, a restaurant or an indoor photo. There are a few other things you can play with. One of them is white balance. All white light sources have an amount of, uh, of different colors in them. White, of course, is made up of the combination of all the colors. And if you're looking at something like candlelight, that's got that red warm glow to it. If you're looking at something maybe like a flash from the camera, that has maybe a much brighter, harsher light to it. And sun sunlight, of course, is there in the middle. And white balance tries to compensate so the whites still look good. So by in a, in a dark, candle lit red kind of environment, the camera might add a tint of blue to the whites to kind of balance them out. And that's the white balance. And you can basically, it's on auto, the camera measures the amount of white and kind of has a guess at what's going on. Or you can set it to cloudy, flash, tungsten, candlelight, and the camera will kind of add in its own kind of tint to compensate for that. And on some third party camera apps, you can also set the white balance. So you point the, the, the camera at, uh, at a white sheet of paper in the lighting conditions, you say that is white and the camera will compensate so that white looks bright white in that uh, particular environment. Now a couple of other quick things you can play with. One is manual focus. Uh, you can actually sort of control the focus like you would on the manual focus ring on a camera. I found that quite difficult to use. I still find either using touch focusing or automatic focusing better, but it's there if you really want to persevere to take a particular type of shot. And the other thing is exposure compensation. Basically, rather than having to fiddle with the shutter speed and with the ISO speed, you can just say, I'd like this to be uh, double the exposure or half the exposure and use the EV number minus one or plus one, minus two, plus two, which gives you double each time the amount of exposure or less. Uh, exposure. And you can actually use that for doing your own manual HDR photography. You can take one at minus EV1, one at zero, one at plus EV, and therefore you get these three different exposures, dark in the middle and bright light, and then you can combine them in to get together in software on your desktop. There's very different applications that you can download, and that will combine them together to give you manual HDR. In fact, some uh, third-party camera apps will do EV bracketing, which means automatically it will take three photos or even five photos at different exposure settings. And then you take those afterwards and you combine them together on your desktop to give you uh, that, um, that uh, uh, HDR, manual HDR mode. So what's my advice for taking uh, shots in manual mode? Basically, don't do everything on manual. Leave most things on automatic and then play with one of the controls. The first one you wanna play with is shutter speed and see what different effects you get by using a fast shutter speed and by using a slow shutter speed. You might also then want to play around with the white balance. And of course, if you're into doing manual HDR, you can play around with the uh, e exposure compensation. But if you wanna do all of them, then really go and buy yourself a, a, di a digital SLR camera because that that's really the best way to do that. But on your smartphone, playing around with one or two of those controls can actually give you some interesting results. I'm Gary Sim from Android Authority. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please do tell me in the comments if you ever use manual mode, are you gonna try and use manual mode and have you had any success with it? Please do subscribe to Android Authority's YouTube channel, follow me on Twitter, and last but not least, do go over to androidauthority.com because we are your source for all things Android.